Is there anything in the castle that we should be afraid of? And Electronic voice phenomena is exactly that. It's electronic. Um, it's a device, an electrical device that's picking up energy. Electricity is energy. And energy exists at the very finite wave particles of this universe. So from the bottom up, this universe is energy. Do you miss your family? Uh, electronic voice phenomena. Anybody else hear that? Is um, evidence under the principle of instrumental communication. And electronic voice phenomena is the audio evidence that people contend uh, to represent deceased individuals. Well, it's just part of the process. I mean, it, it, it's when you start getting into ghost hunting, it's one of the tools of the trade, and it's it's one of the most that is hard to refute. If you're there and nobody else is there, and you're talking and someone else talks back to you, I don't know. it's not like say, well, I saw something. Well, here it is, I heard this. Uh, I had read about EVPs, and I had looked it up on the internet and went to a couple of websites, and really felt drawn to it, like this is my thing. 11 years ago, I was a complete skeptic. I've seen spirits my whole life. And the way I look at them is they're just lost souls. There's enough compelling evidence out there that we should be taking this seriously. Once you open that door, you can't close it. Is there anyone here? I love having these conversations on Paranormal Now with so many guests from so many different disciplines and approaches towards investigating what EVPs are. The very first EVP ever recorded was recorded on a single wire recording by monks doing Gregorian chants. They were so freaked out when they listened to the recording because there was more on there than just the chance. In fact, one of the monks heard his deceased father leave a message on the recording. The monks went to the head of the monastery and told him what happened because their re religious beliefs were that they were not allowed to communicate with spirit. This got escalated to the Pope, and the Pope's response was, it was the device that recorded the spirits, not you, so you're okay. So of course, the monks were relieved, but that was the first recording that ever recorded um, EVPs. But we know they've been recorded on every device since. <laughs> they have the ability to easily manipulate electronics. And uh, it's a fascinating subject and can't wait to see what else we can find. Five, two, two, two. they're in here. There's many, many people who will go into uh, haunted homes, allegedly, uh, with recording instruments, uh, with geomagnetic instrumentation, trying to communicate with spirits, as they call it, and to obtain audio information that they can have as direct proof. A lot of people are afraid of spirits. I'm not, not at, at all. I actually go in there and I, I'm totally different than, than you would think. Most guys that are big guys, they go in and they try and intimidate ghosts, which I find to be stupid. <laughs> Let's just say that. First off, what are you gonna do to them, right? <laughs> and the way I look at them is they're just lost souls. And if they wanna talk to you, they will. If a guy came in my door right now and started threatening me, I'd throw him off the balcony, right? And I assume that would be the same thing they want to do if I go over there. So I go and I'm very polite. And people say this all the time. I say, man, you're the most polite ghost hunter we've ever seen. And one thing that I do that other ghost hunters don't, I explain the equipment before I get started, right? Now, I've been in 1,500-year-old castles in Scotland and Ireland things. And I've seen people go in there and say, yes, can you come to the K2 meter or could you talk into the voice recorder? 
And I'm like, yeah, those people back then were probably real familiar with voice recorders and K2 meters, right? So I will explain to them, I'll say, look, this is something you may not know. This will let me know that you're here. It's got five lights on it. They'll all light up and I'll hold the thing down so you can see it flash. If you hold it, it'll all flash five, right? And I said, it'll do that. I said, and look, it won't hurt you. And I hold it up next to my face. And then I put it down. I said, this will just let me communicate. If you come close to me, it'll make this go off. So if I'm asking you yes and no questions, if you want to answer yes, come close. If you don't, just stay back. And matter of fact, most of the people, even the guys from Scottish Paranormal, who may be the best ghost hunting group in the world, they really may be, they, even they said, man, why does that always work for you? I said, because I make a discussion with them. I just start talking to them. Are you a female? So my nephew and I did an experiment one day. I went out and purchased a, um, an analog recorder, one of those little desktop recorders with this cassette tape. And he and I sat in my kitchen in the quiet and just stared at each other 30 minutes on each side and it was kind of boring but and it was really hard to stay quiet for that long then we flipped it over and we started to listen to the tape to see if there was anything on there and we were shocked when we heard this voice that was so clear it was as if this old man was in the room with us and he said are the spirits listening and immediately after his voice, we heard another voice that said, can I listen too? So there's many different ways people do this. Uh, <clears throat> there's many different types of recording instrumentation designed to obtain communication from discarded entities. How many of us are in this room? <laughs> many individual researchers claim that they can do that. You can hear this on various online formats, um, types of audio input that people do receive. Some of that is very clear and, and time-locked to the, to the questions that are being asked, but there's no clear proof that, that it represents any, any type of deceased entity. I just came here to talk to you. There's so many different theories on it. Well, it's just bleed over from a radio station. It could be, you know, a walkie talkie somewhere. It could be this or that or anything else. Well, horse hooey. It's not a very accurate tool because there's so many different kinds of artifacts that can be created using them. Uh, Crosstalk and radio frequencies in the atmosphere can contribute to a lot of erroneous kinds of interpretations where people think it's it's a deceased person or some spirit when in fact it's not and the brain can easily make this kind of mistake it, well it's first off you're talking on a recorder it's not going to pick up radio signals and things like that i have never had a radio signal on my phone if it picked up radio signals i'd be able to listen to it on, on the recorder all the time right you think in, in the you know many many years i've been doing this that i would have many radio signals i don't I never have any walkie-talkie signals, right? Could it be another cell phone talking? I suppose. But I've been in places where there's nobody else. There's no cell phones around me, right? So could it be something else? Possibly. But when you get a direct answer to a question that you asked. Just say hello. What's up? What's up? Yes. And it's hard to it's hard to be objective, but uh, there are there could be various ways to improve the sensitivity of these recording techniques. Although people, many people contend that they have been successful. However, there have been a few and only a few uh, experiments done at universities. Uh, those that have been done, I believe, the Institute of Parapsychology at the University of Freiburg. There have been a few psychologists that have looked into electronic voice phenomena. None of them have provided any definitive conclusion about the validity of anything that they recorded. They suggested that they did obtain some subtle paranormal-like uh, events, but they still couldn't say with any certainty that uh, the phenomena that they recorded using these techniques lend any, any uh, strong evidence for life after death. 
some EVPs are a whisper and you have classes of EVPs. You have a class A, a class B, and a class C. C is the lowest class, meaning that it can be difficult to hear. You can hear a voice, you can hear tonality in what's being said, but you may not be able to identify exactly what's being said. Class B is clearer than a class C. And then class A is crystal clear. You could play it for anyone and they'd be able to tell you exactly what's being said. Some of the EVPs that I've heard are unbelievably clear and coherent, meaning they are a lucid response to the questions and they be can become almost conversational with the investigator, whether it, you know it's your ghost hunter or a psychic medium. Spirits, can you say hello to me? The other really amazing thing about EVPs and why we are so interested in them is that there is a huge amount of information that you receive from EVPs above and beyond what they are actually saying to you. You can tell whether it's an adult or whether it's a child. You can tell whether it's a male or a female. You can discern whether they're using some type of dialect or a different language. There is a huge amount of information that comes through on an EVP that gives you additional information above and beyond what they're actually saying. What is your name? And that's where the really exciting technological component comes into this with electronic voice phenomena. So there's different ways to think about this, right? It could be transcommunication phenomena, um, intra-communication phenomena, however you want to approach it. You're connecting to the other world. So how, how do you do that? Well, the best way to supplement your work and to validate your work is when you're in a space and you're asking a question, you can start with a simple yes or no question. And if you get a simple yes or no response, then that's compelling. And so then you move forward. And if on those EVPs, which normally you can't hear because they're, they're being sent to this device, not as a sound wave, but as a electromagnetic wave rather, whatever that frequency is, our human hears are not hearing it. The device is picking it up. And so when they respond in a way that confirms or is in line with what you were asking, then that begs, begs further investigation by others and the scientific community. And so when they respond in a way that confirms or is in line with what you were asking, then that begs further investigation by others and the scientific community. After death communication is another form of suggestive evidence of life after death, certainly, or something else. We can't say for sure with 100% certainty, at least I can't. But what's most important is that the people who experience believe it with 100% certainty. Is, are these perceptions of unusual events such as this, is this evidence of maybe biophotons from the body that simply linger in time and space to be seen by people who are sensitive to it for whatever reason? If we could possibly try to figure out what is going on. He spoke to us many times last time we were here. With this common type of experience where people see deceased relatives and friends feel some type of interaction, communication. How can that be? Um, and I can't say for sure that it, it represents the continuity of consciousness to prove the survival hypothesis. We live forever. Well, could it be a remnant of photonic energy? A, something that we leave behind when our body changes to what dust to dust and ashes to ashes and and contributes to the cycle of life in a different way and you can look at reincarnation in that respect too we do contribute 
to the, the development of life and beyond over time. But that's the only thing I can say with certainty to the 150,000 people who died daily. They will, their body will remain here. Should we turn off the light? No. It's not a light. No, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't stop them. When you start a session, whether it be ghost box or EVP, and you start asking questions, one of the very first responses, and there's not a paranormal investigator out there today that hasn't heard this, but you're doing an EVP session and you hear help, 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 or get out, get out. Those are the responses that are so common in doing EVP or spirit box work. I could turn one on right now and you'd be like, I mean, they will call me by name. Hey, Tony. But the, the question is, are they asking for help? And that's where a lot of paranormal investigators say, okay, they, they want to be crossed over. And it may be true. I, I don't know my true theory on whether that works or not. Um, we've done it before. We have moved them out. My wife and I were doing a private home investigation, oh, maybe nine months ago. And this family was being severely influenced by spirits within their home. They had a baby on the way and they were really worried about what would happen. So we went out there and um, we actually had to remove. We called in a friend of ours who's um, been doing this for 30 years, removing spirits from locations. And he removed them. Uh, but we went back a few days later because they were still there. Um, but my wife went into the soon-to-be baby's room. The baby was on its way, and she was recording, and she said, you need to leave here. You are not welcome. You are scaring the family. And the voice came through and said, we're sorry. And they did not see them after that. We have that on recording. It is clear as a bell. Wow. Let's communicate. I know you're here. I just did have something that came through from an old piece of film that I found from the birdcage. I had walked down with the owner of the place down to the brothel area and the poker tables. Now in this place, this is where Doc Holliday, Wyatt Earp, all the bad guys used to hang out. They had the world's longest poker game and that lasted like for three years without ever stopping. Uh, Gunfights galore down there and everything else. And I'd walk down the stairs and I said, did you die here? Didn't get anything. And then I said, did you shoot anybody here or did you kill anybody? I can't remember exactly what it was. And I came down, I set my stuff down and the owner came up and started to talk to me. And you hear very clearly a voice say, I had to. That has to be an answer to the, did you shoot somebody? Because it's, it, did you die here? I had to, it doesn't, that's not how you would phrase that, you know? but I had to. So uh, I have every intention of going back and asking more questions at the bird cage. Um, things like that fascinate me. Who was it that said that? Was it Doc Holliday? You know, who, who, you know, which famous gunslinger killed somebody and they're willing to talk about it? I mean, isn't that amazing? Who'd you shoot? Who are you? You know, that's my, that's my next questions. And I didn't hear it then. And the reason I had nine pieces of equipment at the, uh, and it was just me and the owner ghost hunting this place, which is a big honor. Bill, you know, Billy Hunley was very nice to me. Uh, nine pieces of equipment, within 45 minutes, they were all dead. I mean, the spirits sucked the energy right out of it. They use that sometimes to manifest. And uh, it was interesting that uh, when I got back to my hotel room, the cameras worked. What if we're the spirits somewhere else? And there's somebody somewhere trying to hear us. And um, I don't know, that flipped a little switch in my head. If you're talking about a multi-dimensional plane where those planes for a certain point in time interact, could you be the ghost showing up in their realm? And the responses you're hearing are not them screaming at you from a human perspective to get out, but that you're the ghost in their realm and they're scared, help, because they're seeing some apparition of you and they're saying, help, get out. 
So there's so many dimensions to this from what we've experienced that those questions still need to be answered. Spirits, what day is it today? When we do sessions, either EVP or, or Ghost Box, the amount of energy that they know about your entire life is out, just outstanding. We've asked questions about our early childhood. We've asked questions about things that we have never spoken to anybody about. And they can answer those questions. So it brings us back to the whole universal consciousness is that if we are humans, spiritual creatures in a human body, that consciousness of our individual human life, that information goes to the universal consciousness and they have access to it. We have gotten responses for, like I said, things that have happened to us that have never been mentioned before. And they not only can answer the question, they can answer it correctly. Oh, I think I heard you. So an EVP, if it's picking up a voice, the first question is, is that actually a ghost or is it picking up an energy wave, an electromagnetic wave in the form of AM or FM frequency, um, a walkie talkie nearby? We're hearing this voice, hearing these words and just overlaying and projecting. Um, our narrative of what we want this to be. Since this is all about reading energy, I think what, what we need to do to really better understand this outside of, of you know, trustworthy you know, psychic mediums who, who can report back to us in real time what they see, clairvoyant, clairaudient, whatever it is, we, in order to really trust those devices, we need to have some control. The only thing I think that is as good as a, a voice recording is a thermal image. And when you see a thermal image and you see something that's human shaped, that's cold, um, that's pretty interesting. I got called over to uh, this lady. She was so bubbly. She should have been on a sitcom. Wonderful woman. And I go over to her, her uh, loft apartment and I go all through it. Nothing goes off. I'm not usually when I walk in, I can usually tell if something's there right away, just because I've been doing it so long. Didn't feel anything, right? Go up through her whole place. I came down. I said, Donna, I, I don't think your your house is haunted. And she looks at me. She goes, Oh, I don't either. And I'm like, Huh? <laughs> you know, I'm thinking to myself, Why'd you call me? And then she says, I think something's attached to me. Now spirits can attach to you. You know, and glom on you and come home with you if you don't watch out what you're doing. Well, I didn't know how to quantify that. I had it happen to me, so I know what's, what it feels like and the, the symptoms. So I'm watching her, and I didn't really see anything. So it dawned on me, maybe Donna just wanted to feel better, right? So I said, you know what? Let me get my K2 meter. And I ran it over, and I said, there's, there's nothing there, Donna. And I said, let me get my night vision camera. And I looked at her through the night vision, don't see a thing. And I just got a thermal imager um, adapter for my phone. I thought, let's try the thermal imager. And I looked at it through there and I went, holy crap. And right in her stomach, right about here, there's a black spot. Now, cold shows up, you know, humans show up as white, yellow, red, you know, from heat. Spirits show up as light blue and darker, purple, black. And she had this thing look like a football right here. And I asked her right off the bat, I said, do you have anything underneath your shirt? You know, that could be cold. She goes, no. I said, were you eating ice cream or something? You know, just, and she goes, no. I went, okay, do me a favor. Go up and walk up and down the stairs. So she goes up and I'm filming her. And, and I do have these on film, by the way. Uh, she comes down and it's not a camera anomaly. It's there, right? So I told her, she goes, well, let me show you something. And I showed it to her. She goes, wow, what is that? I said, well, it could be an attachment, but tomorrow do this. Call your doctor and tell him you want to see him because it may be a blockage. This could be something serious, right? And uh, she goes, I will, I will. And she goes, if it is attachment, how do I get rid of it? I said, well, Donna, you're the, you know, you're the queen of your, your kingdom. Tell it to leave. And she goes, well, just say, go away. I said, no. I said, you have to get mad. You have to force it from you. And she goes, well, how mad should I get? And I smiled at her. I said, 
pretend you found your boyfriend having sex with your sister, right? She goes, that much? And I said, and more, right? And she was, I wish I would have recorded this. She was so adorable. I mean, I just love this lady. She goes off. She looks at me. She goes, can I use my faith? I said, certainly wouldn't hurt, <laughs> right? She throws her little hands into fists, throws her hands over, and she goes, by the power of God, get out, get out. I mean, she was so impressive. I almost left. <laughs> right? I mean, it was like, okay, I'm going. After, anyway, she, after a couple minutes, she, she winds down and she's exhausted. She really put everything she had into it. And I let her, you know, chill out a little bit, put the camera back on her, and it's gone. Just a little shadow, just like there's shadows from her clothes, just a little shadow. The black spot's gone. So. Is there anyone in here? Can you say hello? When this began, it was probably two years into our investigation that we moved from EVP to what we call ITC, even though EVP is technically part of ITC, but using ghost boxes to try to get direct communication from spirit. Can you walk up and down the hall for us? The first one we got was your typical SB7. It is loud, it is noisy, it is scratchy but it works. We heard the responses to 99% of the questions we asked, although they were hard to hear because the white noise is so loud that sometimes the responses can be hard to determine what's being said. If there's any spirits in this lounge, can you say something to us? Well, then we, decided that we were gonna to start to build our own. We figured out the circuitry of how it worked and we started building our own, trying to clear up that white noise, not removing it, but make it so that when they respond, you could clearly hear everything that was being said. We had success with that and we continued to move on to ones that were clearer and had less and less and less background static noise. But the real thing that was the wow factor in all this was when EVPs that we received started calling us by name. One of the things my wife always taught me when we first started was don't just go in asking questions. Tell them who we are, introduce ourselves. So we would, I would say, I'm Tony Rathman. I'm just here to speak with you. We're not gonna hurt you. We're not gonna kick you out. We just wanna communicate. We did that for years and are still doing it today. The wow factor came when the EVPs started calling us by name. At first, they would say, hi, Tony, or hi, Cherie. Then it moved to, it's Tony Rathman. Tony and Cherie Rathman are here on the EVPs. Then it moved when we started experimenting with Ghost Box, we'd turn them on. Hi, Tony, hi, Tony, hi, it's Tony Rathman. Hey, Tony. This was the wow factor that told us there were no radio stations broadcasting our name. And if they are, wasn't aware of it and wanted to be paid for it. These weren't coming from radio stations. These weren't coming from, from walkie talkies or baby monitors. This was coming from an external consciousness that we could not explain. Can you tell me your name? So we're in a space and we're asking an alleged ghost a question. And we get an EVP recording, a response to that. But how do we know that that's not our own subconscious sending out a response that, you know, somehow we're able to, to actually manipulate and without even knowing it? Because look, if we're going to entertain the idea that um, people can communicate psychically, then this certainly is on the table. So perhaps our subconscious is responding to our own questions, you know? And so then we are, in a sense, projecting um, this entity out onto the recording device, whether it's analog or digital. And, um, and really, we're just having a conversation with ourselves. <laughs> but even that alone is, is, that's so cool. That's so fascinating. So on this realization that our names were showing up, 
on spirit boxes and EVPs, we decided to take it a few steps further to find out exactly what they could do, what they could see, and how much they could interact with us. We used spirit boxes started out by writing words out on paper. I would not even say what word I wanted them to say. I would literally write the word out on a clean sheet of paper and hold it up in front of the camera. Then through the spirit box, they would repeat the word. I wrote words like happy, smile, elephant, and the responses came through without me even saying what I had written. I would just hold it up. So we know that they could see us. They were responding to prior to things that we said so they could hear us. We tested to see if they could see color and we would put out multiple colored objects and say, what, what object is the blue one? What object is the red one? And the responses came through. No matter what evidence we put out, there are always skeptics like I was 11 years ago saying, oh, that's not true. That doesn't happen. That's a broken radio. That can't work. Well, my response to them is, I've done this for 11 years. I have terabytes of information. How many spirit box do you own and how long have you tested them? And their answer is always, well, I don't use those. They don't work. It's, it's really interesting. You know, uh, the whole thing of, of paranormal, it's a mystery. And anybody that's into mysteries, you got to dive headfirst into it. And, you know, I've been doing it seriously now, and I hate to admit it, 54 years. And uh, I'll tell you, I've seen pretty much everything you can see. The ghost shows, especially that my wife would watch, were ghost adventures, ghost hunters. Um, she was fascinated by it. Well, the, the equipment I bought was all based on the shows she was watching. Yes, she made me sit through a couple of them. So I looked at what they were using, and typical was a night vision camera, an electromagnetic frequency reader, and a digital recorder. So that's what I bought her. When she started playing the particular EVPs for me, I mean, my first rational thought was, there's got to be an explanation for this. Can you please tell me your name? To try and explain that, especially from using a, a scientific view of how this is happening, we couldn't explain it. We went through every rational possible to figure out, okay, did somebody just walk by that we weren't aware of? Did this come from a source, uh, a speaker system within the, the hotel that maybe somebody broadcast something? Why they would broadcast somebody's name and just say a name that we couldn't explain. The further we went into the captures that we received, the more puzzling it became. And we knew that something was occurring beyond what science can explain. So we only had one decision and that was to go back, try again and again and again. The problem with uh, EVPs is you usually get them after you're gone. You start listening to your tapes and later on, but that's the way that happens sometimes. Um, sometimes though, you know, you go back and you hear it and then you can try and catch more. Generally doesn't work. You know, I've seen other people that it has worked, but generally doesn't work. An EVP can be recorded on almost any recording device, whether that be an analog device, such as a digital, such as a tape, or today's digital recorders, which are the most commonly used because they're small, they're easy to move around. My wife has captured EVPs on her cell phone. Some of the best devices though for capturing EVPs need to use a WAV format, not an MP3. An MP3 is what is called lost format, meaning that it condenses the audio and reduces the audio quality. A WAV format in at least a 48K, we usually use a 96K in order to increase the frequency of the recording and allow for the best EVP captures. The higher the frequency in the recording increases the range at which the sounds are captured. 
not in here. My guess is back here. Some EVPs capture captured you do not hear with your human ear, which means it has to be either above 20 kilohertz or below 20 megahertz because that's where human hearing falls off the charts. How the digital recorder is able to take that signal, which is outside of human hearing, and allow it to be heard on the digital is the whole intent of what's considered to be ITC or instrumental transcommunication. Instrumental transcommunication uses a third party device. In the, in the form of EVPs, that's a digital recorder. In the form of direct spirit communication, that's a ghost box. What that does is the box performs on its own without interaction from the subject doing the session. The box has to be able to record and be able to play back what was heard for review. That is the whole concept of ITC. This allows that the person doing the, the session cannot influence what the box is recording or saying. And spirit box, ghost box, or digital recorder can't be influenced directly on what it records, unless of course you're making noise or scratching at it or something along that lines. The box is gonna record something out of your control and during playback, you hear the response. Do you need help? I'm pretty picky about my EVPs. I'm very picky about them. I, I do not like Frank's box. I don't like spirit boxes. I don't like to use them. They're too loud. They give me a headache. They get on my nerves. They're annoying. Uh, I like it quiet. Don't ever whisper when I am investigating with you because you know a thousand hours later of audio recording, I might forget that you whispered something. And I might think it's something else. So we have a rule. We had a rule in Embrippa. We had a rule with the uh, Paranormal Underground, which was the group that I co-founded with my friend Greg Cable. Um, no whispering. Most of our stuff is quiet, you know. And uh, I do prefer digital to analog just because then I don't have to hear the motor uh, that turns the tape in the recording. And um, the sound quality is better and it's easier to, you know, get off and onto the computer. That's bizarre. It sounds like, some of these sound like just sounds and some of these sound like voices. Right. It uses a variety of frequency and the frequencies are layered. That gives us better responses than a single frequency because we have not been able to identify what frequency they speak at and we've noticed they're, they're over the board, so. A ghost box, and there's a difference between what people call them. New people into paranormal call them spirit boxes because television has portrayed it as a spirit box. But for people who have been around for a while, they refer to it as a ghost box. They're the same thing. What a ghost box does, and there's a variety of ways to get it to respond, is that it'll scan radio frequencies at a rate based off an electronical charge that goes into the equipment and makes the device scan across the radio stations. You can manipulate how fast it scans in order to get your white noise or your static level skipping through radio stations fast enough that you're creating, basically it, it spirits will use that white noise and manipulate the background sounds that are in it to create their words and their sentences. So you'll ask a question and then you'll receive a response almost instantly. Sometimes it can take a couple of seconds for them to respond. This is your home? But the whole point of a spirit box is to connect with another consciousness, whether it be extraterrestrial, whether it be spiritual, but you're connecting consciousness to consciousness. So in other words, when you ask a question, you get a response over the device answering your question. And of course, one of the most important things to look for is timing and relevance. Did the timing of the answer come through in a quick enough response to the question you asked and relevance, 
Was the answer relevant to the question you asked? That's what determines whether you are making a connection. Spirits, can you do me a favor? Can you say the word um, elephant? The whole point is that when you're communicating with entities or spirits is that it is a consciousness to consciousness communication, meaning that as a human being, we are locked in this body and the body reacts much slower than consciousness does or mind energy does. And we know this for a fact because we will get answers to our questions even before we finish our last syllables trying to say it, which means they're not hearing us through our voice or our vocal cords. They are hearing us through our conscious thought. Spirit boxes I'm uh, ambivalent about. Please don't tell any other stunt guys I use the word ambivalent in a sentence. Um, I've had some fantastic things happen through the spirit box. I've had some even more fantastic things through the Frank's box. Uh, for the people who don't know what the Frank's box is, Thomas Edison built it and he called it the telephone to the dead because it's kind of like the spirit box on steroids. The cover of the book is the Hellfire Club in Ireland. And when I was there, you know, I was with the Scottish paranormal guys. We got in there and one of the guys had a Frank's box and he was talking to it and nothing was coming back out. And I walked over and said, do you mind if I ask it some questions? He goes, no, go ahead. So I just said, and like I said, my thing is not investigating. I try to talk to him, communicate. And I just walked up, I said, hi, my name is Rick. I'm from the United States. And I came here to talk to my relative, John Wilkes, who was one of the founding members of the Hellfire Club. One time he was the Lord Mayor of London too. Um, evidently he had a really weird sense of humor, so I know we're related. But anyway, um, I said, yeah. I said, I just came, by, came here to say hi. Right? And it says a couple words that mean nothing, which is pretty much ghost hunting, that's the way it works. And then it goes, relative? And both of them, you know, wow. Because I mean, that's just an answer to what I just asked. And I said, yeah, my name's Rick. I came here to talk to John Wilkes. And he goes, hi, Rick. And I mean, they're floored right there. And then I said to him, I said, is it true? This will prove to me that I'm talking to John Wilkes and that you are my relative. Is it true that you dressed uh, a baboon? Uh, did you dress a baboon up like Satan and turn it loose into a party? And it says a couple words and it goes, baboon. And I mean, their jaws just dropped. I mean, it's like, what are the chances? Let me ask you this, you're a smart guy. What are the chances of high Rick, relative and baboon being said within three minutes conversation? I mean, there's, there, and I mean, they were just like, huh, I have another one that I can show you sometime too. I don't have that on recordings. Ghost box, you hear it immediately. Oh, really? An EVP is the only recording device that you have to wait to go back to play. A, a ghost box gives you direct communication, meaning you literally ask the question out loud and the response comes over the box, you hear it immediately. The great thing about an EVP is that digital recorders are small, they're compact, they can be carried with you almost anywhere. And as long as you have a, a somewhat controlled environment where you don't have outside sounds affecting what you're recording, it's the best way to get evidence that there's more going on here than, than meets typical environment. The ghost box is awesome if you want to be able to have what would be considered a more direct communication. Some of the EVPs that I've heard are unbelievably clear and coherent, meaning they are a lucid response to the questions and they can become almost conversational with the investigator, whether you know it's your ghost hunter or a psychic medium. There's so much evidence out there that it really confuses me that, that people are so resistant. You know, I know parapsychology still exists in some universities, but in, in reality, what we need, if you want to study this, is millions of dollars, you know, poured into the study of the paranormal. Because what we're doing here with an EVP, you are potentially communicating with a spirit on the other side. I mean, man, that's, that, that's it.
right? I mean, the biggest questions that we ever ask are, is there more to life than this reality that we see around us? Do we live beyond? Um, is there an eternal life? Are there different realms of the afterlife? And from there, you're, ask, you're asking the big question, you know, what, what's the purpose? Why are we here? So to avoid, as a scientist, studying this phenomena seems contradictory to the innate curiosity that makes science science. The question is always asked of us when you're getting responses, whether it be EVP or whether it be ghost box responses, who is it that's responding? Well, that's a very good question. And one, our research continues to go down to find out. Is it spirits? Is it ghosts? Is it extraterrestrial? Is it multidimensional creatures? Well, that answer is still up for grabs and research is still continuing to go down that road to find out. We have gotten answers from everything from what we know is an external consciousness, not body bound. But we've also received answers that may very well be extraterrestrial. Um, we've done sessions where we were asking questions about who are we speaking to? We wanted that answer. And they gave answers, oh, we're from above. My next question was above, meaning heaven, meaning outer space. And the answers come in slowly. We, we also believe that there are universal laws about what they can do and shouldn't do. Now, they don't always follow those, but there is a line where you hit a wall and the answers just stop. Because again, personal theory, but that we believe this life is sort of a soul school of learning for your own soul. And then you read join that universal knowledge of the entire universe. And if you mix the paranormal with your own world, it's very easy to get sidetracked from your natural life that you're supposed to be living here. And we've noticed that at certain points, whether it be spirit, extraterrestrial, whoever else is communicating, there is a stopping point where they stop giving you answers. And we've literally heard them say, stop talking, that's enough, no more. And they literally stop answering questions the farther you push down that line. It's a strong one. He, he moved. I mean, if you think about how sidetracked you'd be if you had all the answers, if you knew that life continued, if you knew that reincarnation may be possible, depending on what you believe, too much information would really affect the here and the now. And it would affect the whole purpose or reason for human life. And we're still trying to figure that out. What is the purpose? Um, you know, our personal theory is that it's a learning experience for the soul to grow, to, to evolve, and to move on to other realms. But um, if you have too much knowledge of the afterlife, uh, that can limit what you're here to do now and to learn. I mean, I know I've had interactions and I've had EVPs. I've actually heard voices without uh, anything. And I'll give you a, for instance, there's a place called the Pioneer Saloon that's right outside Las Vegas. Very, very haunted. And I've been there so many times. Um, I've been there so many times. And the, the, the girl, matter of fact, on the back of the book, talks about how every time I come there, they hear spirits call me by name when I come in. And it appears that the lady spirit there has taken a liking to me. Right, because, and I took my stepmother there and we're sitting there and, and we sat down and she, she brought out her, her uh, spirit box. And she goes, who's here with me? And this voice goes, Ruby. Now Ruby's the girl who was murdered in Pioneer Saloon, right? And I went, hi Ruby, and goes, Rick, right? So I mean, it happens all the time in this place. I mean, it, it's happened at least a half a dozen times at the Pioneer Saloon. I have heard of incidents where an EVP is corroborated by some sort of physical interaction. I think that again is, that's the sort of evidence that we want. Um, so if you can catch an EVP, if you can also catch something on video on an SLS, which is basically a motion detector designed for video games, could be in pitch black and it can pick up movement and 
it's designed to see the figure of a human being, of joints, right? And so you'll see on this SLS uh, meter that, that, oh my gosh, there's like this stick figure looking thing moving around. If you have something like that happening and, and an EVP at the same time, and both are responding seemingly directly to your questions or inquiries or conversation, um, now you have two technologies that are validating your investigation. I do feel that there are multiple universes, multiple dimensions, and uh, that there are entities that live in them. I think there's some entities in some other dimension that are aware of us and want to make contact with us, um, just like we do them. And um, I believe there's people, for lack of a better <laughs> descriptive word, on the other side that are actively working and, and making, uh, you know, um, equipment to contact us. I view the universes as a cluster of soap bubbles, but each one of these bubbles is a dimension with more life in it. And you know how soap bubbles, when they touch each other, they kind of become one in that tiny little space where they've clung together, however fleetingly. Uh, and I believe that it's in those tiny little spaces where they bump into each other for a moment that we're able to communicate. I just see it all so clearly in my head and it's hard to describe to other people, but I really feel that that is uh, what we're living in here. Um, I always loved it when Michio Kaku used to say, uh, and I probably just wrecked his name and I'm sorry, but <laughs> there's a dinosaur in your living room. I seriously believe that that is exactly correct. And I feel like human beings, our, our bodies, our brains are like tube type radios in a Dolby digital surround sound world. Like we are not made to receive some of the signals that swirl all around us. Like in this room that I'm sitting in right now, there's Wi-Fi signals, there's television broadcast signals from the antenna. I mean, there's, you know, all kinds of signals that I can't see, hear, taste, touch, feel, uh, because I can't receive it, I can't perceive it. And I believe that there's a lot of stuff going on right around us right now. And I, you know, having said that, that I believe there are people that for whatever reasons, either they're born slightly different or they've had an experience that's triggered something uh, out of necessity in their brains. You know, they've somehow grown another circuit, an extra circuit or something, and, and they're more uh, susceptible to being able to see these things and, and have the kind of experiences that I've had. I believe that the experiences I had as a child are what tripped my switch and made me more capable of uh, recognizing and, and maybe communicating with other things. If there's one thing I've learned in my life is trust your gut. It won't lead you wrong and the more you trust it, the better it gets. There are some EVPs that are highly suggestive of a discarnate entity actually imprinting somehow their intention in the manifestation of an audio, audio energy on some recording device. It's clear and time locked to a question that a researcher is presenting in that environment. And it's somewhat interesting, strongly suggestive. Uh, what could it be? Well, science will look at that and say, you know something, it happens consistent enough with this particular EVP that what explanation can we give? Are there anybody in here? So what they think is most plausible explanation. Just so I know is that somehow somebody is actually causing the audio imprint on the recording device using what they term to be super ESP, the super psi hypothesis. Using telepathy of some type, they are connecting with that recording instrument and they are 
causing that response, which they, which they interpret as a deceased entity. Well, you know, if that is true, if science is correct, that, that's remarkable in and of itself. That would prove what? ESP, by default. They're trying to look at the evidence for deceased beings when in fact they're, by mistake, providing fairly strong evidence of telepathic communication, if, if that is an explanation. Other alternative explanations are um, there's geomagnetic or atmospheric energy occurring in the environment causing an audio occurrence like that, or a person simply is, is, is simply mis mistaking again um, an artifact uh, for something meaningful. I don't know what mainstream science thinks about these. I, I don't know what to tell them. If they have doubts, then do your own research. Get your own investigations and start them up. You know, I'm doing the best I can, and I know everybody in the field is trying to be as professional and diligent as possible. I'm probably able to ID 98% of the things that I see and record when I do an investigation. And that's good. That's why I come there. I'm probably my biggest skeptic. And they wear smell. You, you have to have an open mind, though. I think the people that go into a, an investigation or an EVP session with an open mind and open heart are going to be more likely to receive something because they're more... Um, uh, they're more open to it. And uh, I think that that shows elsewhere. You know, I think it attracts communication. Just like a bug zapper in the dark attracts a whole bunch of mosquitoes, you know, because that bright light they see is the only thing they see in the dark, so they head towards it. I think so. If you come in with a bright light and an open heart, uh, I think it, it helps. Mainstream science is definitely aware of EVPs and have been for as long as they've been out. Uh, Frederick Jorgensen was doing, 1959, was doing recording bird calls out in the woods. And when he went back to listen to his recording, found voices on it. Science is well aware of this and they not necessarily dismiss EVPs, but again, with no money involved, science really doesn't pay much attention to it because there's no profit to be made and no money to be given for their research. Um, science has made improvements, though, on the paranormal side about what they acknowledge, and consciousness is one of them. Um, they do believe that consciousness does survive death. And it'll be very interesting to see what happens in the next five or ten years about what science can come back and say, you know what? Yeah, that's, this is happening and this is how we believe it's happening. EVPs is a much broader subject and that can be any kind of communication that's picked up. I think the one that I find just the most fascinating is phone calls from the dead. Now we don't hear about this as much anymore. And this goes back to how I think most ghosts seem to be communicating. So back in the more analog phone days, the landline days, um, someone might have had uh, a loved one or a friend or work associate pass away. Um, and shortly thereafter, after a funeral, they come home, they get a phone call, and on the phone line, there's this real kind of crackly sound, um, that eerie kind of static, and then you hear a voice coming through. Um, it breaks up, and then it comes clear, and you recognize that voice, you know that voice. That was your, your mother or your friend or your brother. Um, and they say, hey, um, I'll see you at the pub or hey, I'm gonna, I'll be home for dinner by whatever time. And they sound like they're just still there, they're alive. Or maybe they say, help me, or I'm confused. Or maybe they say, I love you. You know, all these things come through these phone calls. And I think honestly, in, in most cases, these aren't people who are, are getting prank phone calls, um, especially in the, the 80s and the 90s and early 2000s. The dead phone call phenomena is not necessarily easy to fake. 
because as human beings, we recognize voices really well. And we know our loved ones, right? We, we, we can't be, we're not easily confused. And so for someone to try to imitate the voice of someone that we know intimately and create this whole scene over the phone and create this um, fantastic experience, I think statistically is, is very low that this is, any of these are actually, um, you know, crank calls especially in the 80s and 90s, because it's not like now where we can go on Facebook and just download video, right, of people that we don't know and manipulate their voices and, and do things right on our, our laptop or computer. But in the 80s and 90s, you know, that, that wasn't so simple and easy. And also, we don't have people coming out years later going, yeah, that was me, I pranked it. Uh, or, hey, you know, I'm, 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 I'm so proud of this work that I did and I can, you know, tricked you into believing this is real. Like the uh, alien autopsy body, like, that was a prank, essentially. And you know, years later, we found out, oh, not, not that many years later, actually, we found out, oh, this is not, this was man-made. And you know, the, the people that put that together were kind of proud of their work. You know? so, and we just don't get that with the dead phone call uh, or phone call from the dead phenomena. I don't have any answers. Let me emphasize that. Well, maybe I do. <laughs> maybe I do. But all I can say with certainty is that something profound exists beyond our current understanding. That's very easy to say. We can all easily say that. But what, what it is and how it might explain some of the phenomena we are experiencing, it, it, that remains to be seen. And please be ca careful, cautious how you interpret the evidence. It's easy to be misled and it's important not to and to be as objective as possible. And that, that is easier said than done. They're gonna catch up, no, no doubt about it. Um, like I said, the fact that science is now saying we believe consciousness survives death, I mean, the fact that they even looked into that, because let's face it, when, when a scientist does research, it's usually backed by money. And there is no money to be made in the paranormal, which is a shame because you know, there's so many people interested in it and wanting to know information, but because there's no money involved in it, um, you know, no scientist is willing to take on that effort and that experimentation. So it requires people like us to try to find answers. But they have made progress. And depending on what particular science you're looking at, whether it be physics, whether it be psychology, whether it be parapsychology or, or anything in between, there are overlaps that substantiate things that are being claimed within the paranormal. And let's also add that our brains are tools themselves. And I've mentioned psychic mediums. So our, our brains are creating uh, brain waves as, as we speak. Um, all day, all night, sleep and awake um, from beta to gamma. If you are a spirit or an entity, um, I could imagine that if you're able to manipulate um, energy waves that can be transmitted and picked up on a device, a recording device, that you could also use our waves, right? I mentioned we all have some sort of radioactivity in general, but our brain waves, that you can manipulate that and use that towards um, communicating. Um, and maybe there's something there to that uh, because our brain, our thoughts are often in the form of words. So either they can you know, take our own thoughts in a sense and, you know, filter that into the equipment. Or maybe the ghost is actually us. Yeah, I'm, EVPs are my very favorite part of paranormal investigation. I think they're the strongest case for um, life elsewhere, whether that life be a, a life that was alive here at one time or is living somewhere else right now. No matter what these things actually are, it is utterly, utterly interesting and intriguing. And it's, it's, it's a mystery that definitely needs to be solved.